The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Hey, audience. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. Matt Watto here. Paul, I'm trying something new. What do you think? (laughs) (laughs) I hate it. Yeah. (laughs) Tonight on the show, this is a a Tales from the Curbside or Triple Distilled. I don't know what we're calling this now, but we are revisiting two great Curbsiders classic shows, one on urinary incontinence and another on BPH. We are going to try to distill these down to maybe about 15 minutes per topic and really remind you what you should have taken away from that. And we'll sprinkle in some updates to our practice that have changed since that time. Paul, that's about the gist of it, right? Do you want to tell them what we normally do on the show and and then throw in any other, you know, any other tidbits you would like? (laughs) Sure. No, uh, yeah, happy to. I mean, you did a spectacular job. I'm just gilding the lily now. But we are usually the internal medicine podcast. We typically use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. As you mentioned, this is us recapping two pretty old shows. I, I, I believe the incontinence one's like 2017, back when we were just babies and we didn't know what we were doing in terms of the podcast that we were talking offline. The incontinence episode is with Molly Hoyblind, who's since joined our crew and has been putting out the, the teach episodes. And she by far sounded more polished than me or Stuart. Like she was probably the most professional person. So it's been, it was fun to kind of revisit those, not just to kind of refresh my clinical knowledge, but also just to to recognize and acknowledge how far we've come. Right. And and as you mentioned, Dr. Dr. Molly Hoyblind now hosting her own Curbsiders Teach, which is a separate podcast you can get anywhere. People should check it out. They've so far, as of this recording, released five episodes. By the time this airs, probably six or seven. And Molly, on this uh, urinary incontinence episode, we sort of asked her at the end of the episode a question and she was she said i'd like to hear more episodes on like how to be a clinical teacher and talking about leadership Uh skills and things which is now what they do on the teach podcast so i guess she's been having she's had this in her mind for at least four or five years now uh molly if you're listening uh, i don't know if you remember saying that but it, it was pretty it was pretty cool to listen back and hear that I love the fact that she waited for us to do it, and then when she waited long enough, she just decided to do it herself and probably did a better job. So, yeah, good on Molly. And then also on this episode was just some classic Stuart Brigham where uh, we're talking about oh, urinary incontinence, and Stuart left the conversation for like 10 minutes and then comes back, <laughs> and he and he, had, and he said, tells the audience that he couldn't hold his bladder for the full episode, which was totally unnecessary. And, uh, you know, that's just Stuart being Stuart. Paul, this was so this was episode 53 and we're going to start with let's start a little bit with the history. We we actually made an algorithm for this which I think is pretty nice and still holds up, Paul. There wasn't there were not a lot of updates to this. I I'll give a little bit of updates to the history section, but there weren't a lot of updates and this is something that this algorithm for incontinence is something that I've referred back to um over the years since then because it just uh it's hard to keep all these things straight in your head. Any comments? No, I, I was just, I was, I'm glad you made that point. Otherwise, I would have the algorithm and give yourself credit, actually uh, designed by one uh, Matthew Watto, is something I refer to in my own clinical practice often, especially with teaching, because I, I just think it's a nice job. So it really does sort of break down the framework as to what type of incontinence that you're working with. And then that sort of guides what you're doing with it. So, Matt, when you're, when you're thinking about urinary incontinence, which I'm sure you do often, like what, remind me, what, what is sort of your basic framework and sort of where do you go from there? Right. The, the two most common, I, or I would say three most common ones that we're going to see in primary care are their stress urinary incontinence, which is people that are leaking when they're coughing, sneezing, jumping, and then urge urinary incontinence, which is where when they got to go, they got to go, or they might have an accident. And and then the, the third one is mixed, where they sort of seem to have features of both. And Molly told us some some questions to ask, but she's really, the I think the easiest question is like, do you have bothersome leakage of urine? And you can actually, you were asking on the episode, Paul, about just screening for that because it is so common, especially as women get older. It's it's not as common in men and think maybe 10% or so um, on the higher end of things. But for women, it's like 50% or more as they get up there in age. So do you have a specific way you like to ask about this or do you think about it? 
Um, I, I do ask it almost in that exact same way, um, often from any annual Medicare wellness visits, or I think as we talked on the episode, when you're when you're not talking, when you don't have a whole lot of other ground to cover, which is probably not fair. I probably don't give it as much diligence as I should. But I think the bothersome point is is the one that she underscored, because if it's not bothersome to the patient, then you really don't have to go down this huge rabbit hole in terms of treatment and management. Um, you might do a little bit of work up just to make sure that you can see if there's anything to do to ameliorate it, but you don't have to spend quite as much time if the symptoms are not significantly impacting quality of life, which I thought was a, a really terrific point to make. And there's this three IQ, which are the three incontinence questions, and they pretty much ask about that. Like, have you leaked urine in the past three months? What situations did you leak? And when? what situations do you most often leak? And that can kind of help you figure out if this is an urge incontinence a stress incontinence or or mixed type. And the other one that you might think about more for patients who maybe have cognitive impairment or they have poor mobility is overflow incontinence where people are just, the bladder's getting so full that, that urine just starts to leak. But that is probably definitely much less common than than what I'm seeing in my, my patients. Yeah. And we should also mention, um, Molly made the point about functional incontinence, which is actually quite common but it's worth differentiating from those other couple of things. And functional incontinence, meaning someone just physically can't get to the bathroom in time. So they may not have any bladder dysfunction at all. They may not have any issues with the urinary system itself, but they may have, say, a bad osteoarthritis or some other mobility limiting factor that just prevents them from making it to the bathroom. So there is incontinence, yes, but you're you're dealing more with a an access and a mobility issue than you are with um with the urologic system. Moving on to the exam. When patients come in for this, I I have to say I don't do a huge exam. Most of it is in the history, but you of course you can look for neurologic features that might point you to uh, a diagnosis, and then uh, you can look for organ pro- prolapse, like uh, pelvic organ prolapse. And Paul, as far as the list of lab tests go, it's mainly a urinalysis an A one C, and a metabolic panel, probably looking for things like hypercalcemia, glucosuria or high glucose that's going to cause glucosuria and make people running to the bathroom so often. Do you have anything else on your list? No, I, I really do go that basic. I'm not sure what else I would sort of chase down necessarily. I, I think the urinalysis is probably the most helpful thing. And we were all, you asked the question, which we were all happy to know that we shouldn't be doing this Q-tip test or the cough test, which is where you're you're putting a Q-tip in the urethra and asking the patient to do some maneuvers and those sort of things. That's That's really best left to the urologist office and primary care fortunately for all of us, we we can avoid that. Right. If you're to the point where you're thinking about that, probably that patient should be seeing a urogynecologist anyway, right? Mm-hmm. Now, onto, the, onto some just basic management pearls. Paul, do you have a stock list of things that you tell patients to do if they tell you that they're having urinary frequency or just any of these urinary symptoms? In general advice um, is managing things like constipation. We brought this up in the episode itself and just trying to keep things moving along because constipation can certainly worsen urinary symptoms. Molly gave a lot of great points about fluid intake. And it's it's kind of a, a Goldilocks situation because if you're a little bit dehydrated, then concentrated urine might be a bladder irritant. But if you're overhydrating and you're just carrying around your seven gallons of water to drink throughout the day, you might also be worsening things too. So trying to drink when you're thirsty and not sort of airing too much one way or the other unless there's um, a medical reason to do so. And then also scheduled voiding, I think is very helpful, you know, almost regardless of the type, but I, I think specifically for the urgent continence, I, I think that falls almost under the heading of the bladder training is having people sort mm-hmm. of go routinely. And then you can sort of structure things a little bit more um, as you kind of get to understand the patterns of their illness. What, what about you? How are you counseling patients? I, I do the, I do a lot of those same things. And I, I just wanted to mention on the, the timing of the voiding that you were mentioning, for some patients who are going too frequently, they, they can try to hold it and then stretch out the time period to where they're going. They can go longer periods between maybe every three or four hours, but that would, that might, maybe at first they can only go 30 minutes or 45 minutes without running to the bathroom. And then they kind of try to stretch it out. But there's also for patients who don't think to go to the bathroom, you might have to, let's say it's a patient with cognitive impairment, you might have to prompt them to go every three or four hours. If the bladder's full, it's more likely to leak. And so that's that's part of what, what she was saying as well. And and then the other thing that I usually talk about is just trying to get your fluids in between 7 a.m., 7 p.m., not drinking a huge glass of water before bed if there's someone that's bothered by having to get up throughout the night and then she talked about the foods. I think this is out there. I was there. hoping you'd mention this. This yeah. is out there if your patients are looking it up. It's 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 pretty weak evidence, but there there are this the list that your patients will probably see if they Google search. This would be alcohol, caffeine, chocolate, spicy foods, acidic foods, 
all the kind of things that that we tell people. A, a lot of these are like the same as GERD, Paul. Where <laughs> <laughs> about the same level of evidence, probably. Right. So you, I don't think you have to be too strict about that, especially if your patient loves chocolate or caffeine, which uh, you could put me in the category of loving both those things. I, I think those are it for the lifestyle choices. The thing that if you can access it, it works for both stress incontinence and urge urinary incontinence. This is a this is a pelvic floor muscle therapy. And it's actually, there's pelvic, there's pelvic physical therapists that actually specialize in teaching people to overcome pelvic floor dysfunction. We talked about a little bit about this on our constipation episode recently, Paul. It's a different type of therapy for constipation, patients with uh, defecatory disorders, but this is a similar idea. And this has been helpful. And actually in both places that I've worked most recently in, in primary care, I was able to refer patients to pelvic floor therapists. And I, I think that is actually, of all the therapies we're going to talk about, uh, that is one of the ones with the best evidence and, and is a first line before you even get to the medications. So, Matt, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I think one of the things that we struggle with in the office, we sort of recommend these Kegel exercises or these pelvic floor muscle training exercises, but I, I feel like people have a hard time explaining to patients exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Is there a script that you use or any resources that you rely on for that? I wish that I could tell you that I that I had something that I've been telling patients, but since I've had this referral source to go to, I will tell patients that if they've heard of Kegel exercises or Kegel exercises, not sure how to pronounce it, that they can <laughs> they can try doing those maybe two sets a day, uh, 10 repetitions, something like that. But I refer them. Do you have a specific way that you counsel patients, especially if you're, the referral network is not as robust? It's inter- the way I at least describe the muscles that they're using, and I, we've probably, I think a lot of our listeners have probably heard this already, is actually it's the same muscles that you use if you're trying to cut off the stream of urine uh, mid urination. So that whatever whatever you're doing to clench at that time, those are the muscles that you're actually trying to trying to tighten up. And basically, what you're supposed to do is is repeat these exercises three times a day. You're supposed to do three sets of ten to fifteen repetitions where you you clench, hold for three seconds, and then relax for three seconds is the instructions that you can give the patient. And I. I'm at least fortunate enough um, to have an electronic health record that has some after visit summaries and some resources that can also include um, to give the patients a little bit more support because it is just sort of ill-defined and kind of hard to hard to describe well. This episode is sponsored by M3 Global Research. Their panel features millions of patients and healthcare professionals worldwide, supported by a dedicated team who offers support and transparent communication. They have a large variety of healthcare market research opportunities available, everything from surveys to interviews to discussions focused on healthcare developments. And what this does is help shape patient advocacy by identifying blind spots in current health processes and products and helps inform real world patient and physician experiences touching medications, devices, and treatments. So this is a great way For you as a health professional to participate and earn some extra money. And you can participate wherever you are, on the phone, during a break, even between meetings on a weekday. Their studies work to fit your schedule and convenience. To join M3 Global Research's panel, go to m3research.info forward slash curbsiders and complete registration before February 28th, 2022 for a $10 welcome bonus. That's m3research.info slash curbsiders. Let's recap what we've talked about so far as far as the non-pharmacologic therapies go, because then we'll get into the pharmacologic therapies to round out this discussion. So for both stress incontinence, mixed incontinence, urge incontinence, just some of the general counseling we talked about were, were things like some of the irritants, there's not great evidence for that, but you can you can tell them if they want to try cutting out certain irritants and seeing that helps, that's that's okay with them. They want to try to avoid having a bladder that is too full so they can do this timed voiding where they, they go at least every three or four hours. And then if there's someone who has urge incontinence and they can't make it long enough, then they this, this bla- part of bladder training is setting an alarm and trying to space out the time longer and longer until you get to the desired time between voids. Pelvic floor muscle training is great if you can access it. Otherwise, Paul, what is it? Mayo Clinic has a guide that patients can 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 look up and tells them a little bit about it. Yeah, as with for almost everything else. Yeah, there is uh, under their, their women's health, um, they have a, a how-to guide of Kegel exercises right. for women. 
And then another one that I don't think we mentioned though is weight loss. That weight loss can help a little bit as well. If that's uh, if the patient has weight to be lost, then they can try weight loss as well. But for stress incontinence, there's not really medications that are recommended. Once once you exhaust the non-pharmacologic options, there are some things like pessary. There are certain pelvic floor surgeries or bladder surgeries, like sling procedures that patients can go after. And then Molly told us, Paul, about this. It is called a OTC bladder support. And there are some brand names for that. But if you if you just search in bladder support in, on Amazon or CVS, any of those, Rite Aid, then you can find some of these. And that that's something else patients can try that almost works like a pessary, but it's over the counter. It doesn't need to be expertly fitted. Right. For urge urinary incontinence, Paul, what are you using pharmacologically? Do you have a pathway there? Is that Are you regularly prescribing meds for this? I, I often find myself kind of up against the wall in terms of what's covered by insurance. And so I, I think I, I do start with the, the short-acting anticholinergics, like the, um, the immediate release oxybutynin is probably my, my go-to just because I know it'll be covered, even though I, I realize that that's the one that probably has the most side effects to it. I, and I, you know, it's... I don't do the beta agonists so, so much. And again, partially for insurance reasons and partially because the efficacy does not seem slam dunk home run. So I think if I've exhausted the the lifestyle modifications and the public floor uh, muscle training, and then they're not tolerating the anticholinergics at that point, I probably do uh, refer to your gynecology and, and ask for a little bit of backup and see if there's anything else that I can offer those patients. What's what's your particular algorithm? I, I have a very similar algorithm. I a lot of my patients, it just tends to be they've they've already tried a medication, but certainly if I am going to try a medication, it'll be a short trial and we'll both decide whether or not it's working because these these medicines are highly anticholinergic and they can worsen cognitive function. There's dry mouth as a side effect. There's all sorts of all the normal all the normal anticholinergic side effects that we don't love, especially in our older patients who tend right. to be most affected by this condition. For beta-3 agonists, we mentioned this a little bit on the show, there, it, there can be a slight raise in blood pressure. And when you look at the trial data for these medications, it, the, there, while there's a statistical benefit or difference, I should say difference, I don't want to even call it a benefit, <laughs> The clinical benefit is is uncertain, and the average clinical benefit is not that great. So maybe some patients are going to benefit, some patients are not, and I, I think most patients are not going to benefit. Unfortunately, this way is like maybe thirty percent are going to benefit, but the other two thirds are not going to notice a, a benefit. So it is worth a try, especially if you've done everything else and and you're otherwise facing a referral to a urogynecologist or urologist for a potential surgical procedure. But the for right now, I, I don't use these meds that much, but some of my patients are on them and I just try to do my best. Have you have you seen the percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation? Because I, I will tell you that I have not. I've seen the botulinum injections and anecdotally have seen fairly variable success. But the the nerve stimulation that we talked about, I've, I've not personally seen. And you've seen that in your own practice at all? E- yeah, I have actually because uh, a previous cash select that I worked at, they did have a clinic that did that pretty regularly. And oh, I will great. say that the success rate seemed similar to what I was seeing with medications where some patients were like, oh, that wasn't worth anything for me. And then other patients would say they, they felt that it, it helped them. So I, I think it's if your patients are game and it's available locally, it, it's okay to try it. But it, I can't say that it is a slam dunk home run going to help everybody. It seems reasonably low harm compared to the other interventions. Not that I've done due diligence and a deep dive on it, but yeah. compared to some of the other stuff that we offer, it seems like it's it, it's probably not going to hurt anything at the, right. at the minimum. Right. And Paul, one last thing I wanted to touch on just as an update, which we hadn't talked about in the history section. I probably should have put this up in the history section, but there was a study by Boyd in 2020 that looked at a history of intimate partner violence sexual assault, PTSD, any any lifetime history of those things, and whether or not women were more likely to have those if they were presenting with urinary tract dysfunction. And it seemed like there was an association. So what I would just say to our audience in primary care, seeing patients, if you have a woman, middle age or older age presenting with urinary tract dysfunction, just be aware that they are more likely to have maybe experienced intimate partner violence or some of these other traumatic events, and that you should do a you know, trauma informed approach, as you should always be doing when you're yeah, when you're huge. doing an exam and and taking the history. And 
with that, Paul, I think we should move on to our next topic, which is benign prostatic hyperplasia, right? It's not hypertrophy, it's hyperplasia we learned from our guest, Dr. Adam Reese. And this was a this was a Paul Williams production, I believe. So Paul <laughs> Yes. A Paul Williams joint. Yeah, that's right. Paul, tell me what what background do we need to know in order to uh before before we delve deeper into this topic? Yeah, you made the point. I, I don't know how important this point is, but since we we opened the door, we may as well walk through it. But it's we were counseled in terms of terminology that we're probably talking about hyperplasia, not hypertrophy. The distinction being that hyperplasia is a proliferation of cells, and hypertrophy is a increase in size of cells. So, for being specific about the um, pathologic findings, this is hyperplasia. And by the way, that can exist without symptoms. So we don't say this patient has BPH just because they have symptoms. That's a different thing. So the, the urologists and People who discuss this talk about lower urinary tract symptoms due to BPH once we actually have all the pieces in place for that. So the symptoms specifically are low urinary tract symptoms that we're talking about. And those may not necessarily be from the prostate is, I guess, the other point that that Adam made as, as we were talking things through. I think the other important background is it's, just, it's super common. Like it's in, in men or patients with prostates over the age of 45, um, you're, you already have BPH, um, whether or not you're having symptoms or not. And then at the age of over the age of 60, about 60% of patients have lower urinary tract symptoms than 80% 80, uh, 80 of patients. So a nice, easy way to kind of remember those things. So as your age goes up and you crack 60, you're, you're just much more likely to have these lower urinary tract symptoms associated with uh, the prostatic hyperplasia. So something to look forward to for us, Matt. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, Paul. I'm not really looking forward to a 60% chance at age 60 of <laughs> having lower urinary tract symptoms. What about the... Uh, so you're mentioning symptoms and the history... Do you use this IPSS, which I'm sure we'll get into? He he mentioned it on the show. Is that something you're using in your primary care clinic? I do. I do believe it or not. Um, probably, I, if, if I'm being honest, not as often as I should. I think it's in the same way that, you know, like, I, I think it's analogous to PHQ-9, where probably sometimes I rely on Gestalt more than I should, rather than sort of these sort of validated, nice, objective measurements. But I, I do, particularly in patients where it's the primary concern or it's really impactful to them, then I, I when it becomes important to monitor even sort of small changes in and how they're feeling, I do use the IPSS. Um, right. And it doesn't take all that long to fill out. How about you? I don't think to use it as often as I should. But now, because part of what we'll talk about tonight or what we'll mention now, the, the tw in 2021, the AUA put out a new guideline on BPH, and they actually mentioned that they recommend following the IPSS, which is the International Prostate Symptom Score. And it's, I believe, out of 35 points. And you can follow it on... Uh, on serial visits to see how the patient's doing on therapy, which I believe is not really a strong evidence base. It's more of like a, one of those consensus or expert opinion recommendations, but it seems like a reasonable thing to do. Well, it's it's funny, just like incontinence, um, the, the last question after you kind of break down, and we can talk about the types of symptoms a little bit, but the last question is, can you live with this or not, you know, without, <laughs> without treatment? Like, it's just how, how much does this really bother you? Because it, again, this is where quality of life becomes important. You know, is it, is it worth the patient to go through, you know, the, these trials of medications and make these lifestyle adjustments? And if they're like, yeah, I've got some prostate symptoms, but I kind of don't care. Like I'm, I'm old and this is part of the package. Then, you, you know, your work here is kind of done, but if it's bothersome to the extent that they actually want treatment for it, and that, that changes things significantly. With the history, patients coming in, urinary tract complaints, Paul, and before we get deep into the patient that has BPH with lower urinary tract symptoms. What if it was like a 25-year-old coming in with lower urinary tract symptoms? Is it likely that this could be BPH? <laughs> I have to, I'm grateful you didn't frame this in the, the usual, um, <laughs> just grossly incorrect way that I didn't get to correct. I think I threw you off by throwing it to you in a straightforward way. <laughs> yes, but yeah, probably unlikely to be BPH, right? Like this is this is a disease of of longevity. If a patient has urinary frequency or lower urinary tract symptoms at a younger age, I would certainly I would be chasing down a different diagnosis. And I might, you know, this I think all patients would, as part of the AUA guidelines, and I think what Adam talks about, all patients are at least owed a urinalysis if they have lower urinary tract symptoms. But those are the patients where I'd also be chasing down. Um, STI screening fairly aggressively. I might be chasing down things like uh, new onset diabetes that's been underdiagnosed. I might look for other reasons for either bladder irritation or or maybe even neurologic causes of, right. of symptoms as opposed to uh, a prostatic cause, just because it just doesn't it just doesn't quite fit for me. I don't and know how does that us, change your. Well, he gave us the age of forty. He said it, under forty, yeah. I'm thinking most likely this is not going to be BPH, and that is I I thought that's very helpful to just think about, but. 
if if you have a 50 men 55 year old guy coming to you paul what else are you going to pay attention to in the history you'll you'll give them the ipss to fill out what else is important for the audience to key in on yeah, so the IPSS, not not to dwell too much on this, but it help, helps categorize the symptoms as well. The domains actually kind of break these things up a little bit. So when, when we think about the symptoms, the, when we think about lower urinary tract symptoms, they tend to be divided into these obstructive or voiding symptoms versus irritative or storage symptoms. And the obstructive symptoms have more to do with just uh, the prostate getting larger and actually causing sort of a little bit of outlet obstruction. And those things are what you might expect. So things like your stream is weakened or you have to strain to void or it takes a little bit longer to get started or you just don't feel like you empty out the entire way or even post-void dribbling as opposed to the irritative symptoms. And those are things like the nocturia, the urinary frequency, the fact that like you when you got to go, you got to go. You have a sense of urgency. Those are, are sort of more the irritative storage type symptoms of, of prostatic symptoms. To get back to your question, the other things I ask, again, not not all that different from the incontinence questions that I might ask. I think I ask about bedtime drinks, like are you drinking after uh, after seven o'clock? And then what are you drinking? When's your last beer? If you drink alcohol, you know, what's your caffeine intake look like? How much do you drink before bed? What medications do you take? Adam made the joke that, you know, probably most urologists are not going to play around with the patient's thiazide. But if, if they're presenting the primary care office, that might be something that you could make an adjustment with if there's other antihypertensive options, because certainly that could be a culprit that could easily fix things. I don't know. What kind of things do you think about, Matt? I don't have much to add to the history. I think you were pretty comprehensive there. So let's move on to diagnostics. What are you What are you going to go to next as far as um, exam goes, other than the rectal exam, which digital rectal exam, which I'm sure we're going to talk about? Is there anything else you're examining before you get to that? Frankly, before I get to that, no, not really. Like I, I think, <laughs> you know, again, you know, you could, you, you, if it, if indicated, you could do sort of a more thorough neurologic exam if you're not convinced this is the prostate. But if if all signs and a patient uh, risk factors point to to prostate cause, then I, I think you start with a prostate examination. I, you know, we talked in the episode. I don't think a lot of primary care doctors are super duper comfortable with it. But you're, you know, Adam actually made it kind of binary. Like, yeah. is this a gigantic prostate or not? Um, or do I feel a, a hard nodule or don't I? So, like, really just looking for is it more enlarged than you would expect, or are you feeling a hard bump there that doesn't belong there? And if, if those are the cases, then probably they want to see their friendly neighborhood urologist, and and that's. I think that's I think most of us can feel fairly comfortable with that. Yeah, I like I like the fact that I like the fact that it's binary the binary make it as easy as possible. We're not trying to we're not trying to guesstimate like how many grams is this prostate? That's oh, God, that's yeah. a urologist <laughs> that's a game urologists can play that I do not care to participate in, but we can certainly uh we can certainly try to feel for a rock hard nodule, make sure that and and guess whether or not it's big or not big. That's I think that's right. right. It's a game they can play in terms of assessing volume, but as we talked in the episode, um, doesn't sound like they're actually particularly no. great at it. There's a lot of variability anyway, so it's it's more just looking for gross pathology, which I think is well within our realm. And and you already mentioned urinalysis is is reasonable for everybody that's presenting with lower urinary tract symptoms. Any other testing that you're going to get on these patients? Dare I ask about PSA post voiding? Post void residual. What else do you look for? Yeah, I, I do want to touch on the urinalysis before we move on to the other stuff. Just to, get to what you're looking for specifically. You know, we we mentioned um, leukosuria, uh, which I, I think it, I I have diagnosed diabetes um, through urinalysis before. But other things, you know, hematuria probably warrants a referral to urology, uh, especially um, for patients with prostates who are having lower urinary tract symptoms and hematuria. They probably warrant a little bit more of a workup. And then it's, it's reasonable also to make sure that you're not missing any proteinuria or any any hints that there might be an underlying uh, renal issue as well. In terms of other testing, you can do post-void residual. And actually, I will say um, point-of-care ultrasonography, I do more of that than I used to in the past. Uh, the device that I have actually has a built-in bladder scanner. So just, it's funny, I think the AUA guidelines don't say that there's actually universally accepted definition for urinary retention, but you can track over time if someone's doing better at emptying out their bladder or not, and that's where the utility is. And then you mentioned a PSA. I do check. And we talk about this on the show. It can sort of help confirm your suspicions. You know, we, we talked about this separately from its use as screening for prostate cancer, because that, that is a sticky wicket. But in terms of um, lower urinary tract symptoms, if it's sort of slightly elevated, that might confirm your diagnosis. But more importantly, if it's like even lower than you would expect, it seems to make things a little bit less likely if I understand what Adam was saying. So I, I do tend to check just to make sure it's not a bazillion or make sure that it and just make sure it's kind of in line with the diagnosis I have in mind. But the, the cancer screening is probably a conversation for a different day. Yeah, we can move away from that. But he did mention that and he, he mentioned how he interprets the free PSA. But I, I think for this, the PSA seemed 
as we move into talking about management here, it seems like, the, especially if you're going to use the five alpha reductase inhibitors, it, yep. it, they they actually have a cutoff that's in the guidelines. Uh, PSA should be at least 1.5 if you're right. going to think about the five alpha reductase inhibitor being effective. And the reason is because that the PSA is reasonably correlated with prostate size and a five alpha reductase inhibitor is really meant to decrease the size of the prostate and the number of cells, the the hyperplasia that's going on. And if it's not big enough, it's not going to be beneficial to the patient. Right. You get the side effects without the benefit. Yep. Beautifully said. This episode is sponsored by Indeed. It's a new year and you deserve a fresh start in all parts of your life, even at work. So take your team to the next level with a hiring partner that makes it simple to find candidates with the right skills, and that partner is Indeed. Indeed is where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place, and you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements, or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple sites, you need one powerful hiring partner that can do it all. With tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews, you're going to find great people quickly. And with Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have requirements. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash internal medicine. Offer valid through March 31st. Go to indeed.com slash internal medicine to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Indeed.com slash internal medicine. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. So let's move in. Let's move into the talking about medications. What what is our first line here? We've talked you you talked a little bit about the lifestyle stuff, the things they should avoid, the caffeine, the alcohol, the double voiding. We talked about the the you know trying to trying to uh, limit your fluids in the evening. What else What else do you tell them about? And then when do you get into medications? Yeah, it's I I don't. I don't counsel um, the, the urethral milking probably as, as much as I should. I know that you had a lot of wild enthusiasm for that during the episode, <laughs> but that, that was also another lifestyle thing that you can recommend. The first line medications, um, and this this goes along with the AU guidelines too, are your alpha blockers. And they're, they're a little bit uh, agnostic when it comes to selective versus non-selective. So just as a reminder, you have these selective alpha blockers, which are tamsulosin and psilocin, and then you have the non-selective, which are terazosin and doxazosin. So the, the way you might, the way I at least choose is if I have someone that I, who's older, which these patients tend to be, and I'm worried about orthostasis, I favor the selective alpha blockers myself. Um, if you have someone who, say, has blood pressure that's been challenging to control, um, the non-selectives might be a reasonable option. Um, so I, you might pick a doxazosin instead, which may actually give you a little bit of blood pressure control and help um, with some of their, their prostate symptoms. Is that fairly similar to how you approach things? Yeah, absolutely. Paul, do you have any specific recommendations about the timing of these agents? I think that that's something that I've I've heard anecdotally. Some people say take certain agents at different times. Yeah, I I, I typically so I I don't have brand loyalty except for I know the one that tends to get covered the most. So I mentioned I, I favor the selectives, and the selective I favor is tamsulosin, just because I've not had to fight anyone over it. Um, and so that way I'm more familiar with the dosing. And that one I believe specifically is recommended to be taken at nighttime. And my understanding is you do that to to avoid some of the potential orthostatic symptoms, even though the selectives are less likely to have them. I think others are better absorbed with meals. So if if you have a different favorite, it's probably worth just sort of consulting with Dr. Up-to-Date or your your favorite resource just to make sure that you're you're dosing at the right time. Right. Yeah. My my main reason for for asking patients to take them in the evening is just the orthostatic symptoms as well. And I don't know specifically for each agent about the uh the timing with meals, but I would I would recommend people look it up because I don't think it's exactly the same for each agent just on the quick search that I did for this. It was so get familiar with an agent and and stick with stick with the dosing plan for that one. What about if you're putting patients on alpha blockers, Paul, you're telling them to take their tamsulosin every evening and how quick can they expect to see benefits? And then if they're planning a surgery, is that a problem? 
Great, great questions both. Um, it's almost like there's discrete and important answers that will elucidate learning points. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think the, the, the alpha blockers are nice because you can expect to see results relatively quickly. So if, if taken faithfully and there's no side effects, you can probably expect to see some benefit in about a week, which is not bad um, and different than the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, which take longer and we'll get to. And I, I mentioned in the episode, and this remains true, every board exam I've ever taken, every in-training practice examination I've ever done, I think it's been on every mix-app question is all the same. It's you have to know about floppy iris syndrome. And it, it's apparently it's a real thing. And there's not a whole lot to do about it. I don't know that it would stop you from using the therapy if indicated, but the patient's ophthalmologist should know if the patients are on these so they, they know um, if they should hold them prior to surgery. Because I've seen videos of it. Have you actually seen the uh, the floppy iris? No, video? I haven't. I haven't. I, sh- I got to look these it's, up. It's bananas. Um, so it looks like it would be challenging to operate on. So I I, I do not want to diminish the fact that they, they may impact ophthalmologic surgery. So do do it patients to let their ophthalmologist know that they need to let them know they're taking these medications if they're having any procedures done. I, I like the way Dr. Reese described it as, uh, my friend's an ophthalmologist and he said that the iris is a disaster on tamsulosin. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> and I guess, so it, it relaxes smooth muscle in the prostate and uh, in the bladder neck. So I guess it could do the same in the eye and maybe that's why the iris is floppy. I don't know, Paul. I'm not an ophthalmologist. I mean, I, listen, I'm no ophthalmologist. I'm well, barely a doctor. What about, okay, so symptoms, it, it treats symptoms pretty quickly. And if if they're going for eye surgery, you got to make sure that their ophthalmologist knows that they're taking this and probably they're going to have to stop it before the surgery. But Paul, all the all the medicines, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, maybe I will, maybe I will use this, this uh, <laughs> on this one, Paul. The, they work in about a week too, right, Paul? Such a such a great question, but not not correct. And thank you for asking. No, they they take they take longer to work. So the the five alpha reductase inhibitors, they're they're interesting medications. We, I think we talked about a lot of the important points already. But they they take about a month at least before you start to see the benefit of them. Um, Adam specifically says that he rarely uses them as monotherapy. I, I think the AUA guidelines say that if you meet the criteria that you mentioned, like you have a larger prostate volume or your PSA is up or you have a palpable prostate on a digital rectal examination, you can potentially use it as monotherapy. But it sounds like in practice, almost no one's doing that. It's almost always add-on therapy to the alpha blockers. And then, you know, we, they take longer to, to work. And then the, the other caveat is that these agents reduce PSA by about 50%. And you should know that. there. It's um, So there is the potential to sort of be late in diagnosing prostate cancer if you're following a PSA because it's actually artifactually reduced or not even artifactually, it's just reduced by these agents. So if you're going to start it, you should know what the patient's baseline PSA is and sort of work from there. So that's another probably good reason to check as part of your initial workup for um, for the management there. Yeah. It, one thing one thing I had found about this, that, that this Matt Sakawa in 2017, they actually looked about if patients were on alpha blocker and the 5 alpha reductase inhibitor and they'd been on both for a year that you could at that time stop the alpha blocker. And at least for patients who didn't have the the highest BMIs in this trial, it seemed like they did just fine with just the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor as monotherapy, which mechanistically makes sense, right? Like the alpha blocker was working more quickly. And then while the prostate was shrinking on the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, then once that process is done, you can take away the the alpha blocker and and they can still have the benefit. But I, I can't say that I've done that in practice, Paul, but I think it, it makes sense. It, it would be reasonable to try it, especially if you have a pa- one of those patients is like, which of these meds can I get rid of? Yeah, for sure. And especially, you know, these will probably be older patients where polypharmacy will be an issue. Like that's a really attractive option if if, if possible. Uh, now, I want to ask you when you're, when you're starting these agents, I, I'm wondering what kind of counseling do you do about potential side effects? So we, you know, for the for the alpha blockers, we've got the floppy iris, and uh, <laughs> you know we mentioned possibly the orthostasis. But when you, for the, I feel like the five alpha reductase probably warrant a little bit of a special discussion about their their adverse effects. What kind of what kind of counseling do you do for your patients? Right, I I was really scared off by this post finasteride syndrome that was reported, which is essentially it said they say men can have sexual dysfunction that continues on even after the men have stopped taking finasteride. Which which is really scary, and and that if you told that to patients that hey if we give you this you might develop uh you might develop erectile dysfunction that doesn't go away or sexual side effects or gynecomastia and those those might continue even if you stop the medicine and then when I was reading about this the both the up to date article and the as you were mentioning Paul the the new guidelines mentioned that it seems a bit 
more controversial than that. Is is that your take as well? That it's not it's not clear whether or not post finasteride syndrome is a real thing, or that it's 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 common enough that our patients should just avoid these agents outright. Yeah, it sounds like it's not been that we've not had opportunity to study it as an entity, and it's also not terribly well defined as of yet, too. So I think between those two things, I don't think they could speak with any confidence about its existence, which I, I think is probably a fair point to make. Yeah, I mean, some of what I was looking at is like the the there there looks like there was all sorts of bias in the in the studies pointing to this that the mechanism is not necessarily plausible as to why they would have this permanent dysfunction even after stopping the agent. And that there are some newer uh, trials or studies, obs- observational studies that that really didn't find this symptom. So I, I think that it should be a conversation that that sexual side effects, gynecomastia, um, sexual dysfunction could result from from the five alpha reductase inhibitors, but not necessarily that they're that they're permanent. And I'm not using them that much, so it, it doesn't. It's not like it comes up every day for me. The alpha blockers, certainly, a lot of my patients are on those. And also not without sexual side effects too. Yeah. So like it's, it's again, you're, you're still, you should do your due diligence and counsel your patients appropriately because that might be more important than their lower urinary tract symptoms of them. So there, there is the possibility for rectal dysfunction or actually an ejaculation or decreased, um, I think volume of ejaculate is something else that came up. So it's, it's worth having those conversations with your patients. So A, they're not alarmed and B, they can sort of make an informed decision as to whether or not they'd like to pursue that therapy or not. I think the last thing that I wanted to talk about therapy wise was the to uh the daily tadalafil, which is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, typically I would have thought of this for erectile dysfunction. And more and more now I'm seeing patients that are on this, if they have both erectile dysfunction and they have BPH with lower urinary tract symptoms, they're putting they're being put on this five milligrams tadalafil daily. And I think maybe why I'm seeing it more now is because it it now seems like it's generic and it's the cost has gone way down. I think a couple of years ago it was still a branded medication. And it was just, yep. uh, he mentioned on the show that it, he's filling out all this paperwork to try to get it covered. Have you seen this as well? Or have, have you put any patients on this? No, I, I think I tried to fight in the good fight a couple of years ago and it was just, it was, it was an uphill battle and I don't think I was successful. It's, I've not had recent opportunity to, to try it again for patients or the right patient to present with it, but it's, I do keep it in the back of my brain whenever we're having conversations about uh, LUTs and symptoms. Yeah. And, and Dr. Winter on our either just airing, I, I can't, Paul, it's, it's too late at night for me to check and, and think about this, but I, it, either it will have just aired or it's just about to air our episode on erectile dysfunction with Dr. Ashley Winter. And she was really uh, enthusiastic about uh, Tadalafil saying that now it's it's much easier to prescribe and, and taught us all about how to prescribe that. So look out yep. for that one. If you if you haven't heard that episode yet, it's either coming out or it, it just uh, it will be out in just a week or two here. Is there anything else with this, Paul, uh, that you wanted to talk about before we we start to wrap things up for this episode? Um, not, no, I, th- I think we did a fairly good job covering. I, I think in terms of just follow up, which is, is probably worth mentioning briefly, it's you know, Adam, I think this is a rule of thumb that's probably good for anything, but it, he sort of bases his follow-up in terms of how much it's annoying the patient. So like he will, if someone is truly, truly bothered by their lower urinary tract symptoms, he might see them in four weeks. Otherwise, he tends to favor a little bit of a longer time just to make sure that the medications settle out and have a chance to actually do what they're going to do. So I, I thought that was a, a helpful point in terms of when to reassess. Right. So to recap for the medications, uh, of course, we give all the patients our lifestyle modifications. We review their meds, make sure if they have a diuretic that can be stopped or switched, we try that. But then alpha blockers are the first line. Watch out for floppy iris syndrome. (laughs) Five alpha reductase inhibitors can be used in combination. And if your patient has both erectile dysfunction and BPH, you can think about using Tadalafil and reassess them in four weeks, maybe three months after you initiate therapy and see how they're doing. And that about wraps it up for this, Paul. I mean, I think we, we of course, if, if that's not working at that time, I guess at that follow-up visit, a referral to surgery would be the next step, which is beyond the scope of this discussion. Yes. Yeah. The the, the I, I will point the audience to the fact that the AUA put out a two-part guideline. The first part was on essentially what we talked about tonight, which is the medical therapy and the second part was all about the surgical therapy. And there's like 20 different procedures that they might do for BPH, Paul. Some of them I hadn't heard of. There's microwaves involved, all sorts of things. It's, it sounded <laughs> sounded great. Lasers. Lasers, sure. microwaves. Urologists are way cooler than us. We, we already knew that. 
So, Paul, will you take us into the outro? Happy to. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy? Okay, sure. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com, and while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our new Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value, practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we want your feedback, so please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Now, on Spotify, give us a rating on there. Or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to our whole team. Beth Garbs Garbatelli is our executive producer and runs our Twitter. Nora Toronto is the editor of The Digest. Maddie Mad Dog Morgan is on Instagram. Tima Karganov does the website. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. Claire Morgan of Notterly edits our audio. And finally, Chris the Chew Man Chew is on Facebook, or is it Meta now, Paul? I might need to change this. It, I think it's Meta now. Is it Meta? I thought Meta was just the virtual reality universe. I don't know, because I've not been on Facebook for about three years. Well, it, it all sounds terrible. We'll Where figure we it out Chris before next yeah. episode. Until next <laughs> sure. time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you, and good night from the Metaverse.